Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about the problem of evil. Or perhaps I should say the problems of evil. I say that because there are three very distinct versions of the problem of evil. I've discussed these elsewhere as well, um, at least briefly. But this time I would like to go into detail um, on these three types of the problem, these three versions of the problem. What differentiates them, and therefore how we ought to respond to them. Uh, at least generally. I don't want to go into details on uh, the specific responses to each of them, uh, at least not in this video. Um, but this is primarily, as I said, to distinguish between the three versions. Now, those three versions of the problem of evil are the logical problem, the evidential problem, and the emotional problem. Of these three, only the first two are, strictly speaking, philosophical problems. The third is what I would refer to as a religious problem. Now, one might, one might counter and say that all of these are religious problems. These all have to do with objections to the existence of God. Right? All of these seem to be about, well, they are about, um, whether or not God exists, arguing that the existence of God is impossible, it's incoherent, it's incompatible with what we observe about reality. However, that does not make a problem religious. Now, that can make a problem theological. However, there is an important distinction. The third of these, the emotional problem of evil, is a uniquely religious problem and a non-philosophical problem because it doesn't provide an objection to a philosophical premise, that being the existence of God. Instead, it accepts the existence of God, the emotional problem. It accepts whatever theological beliefs we might hold as a given. But within that framework, it asks, it, it brings up, let's say, the difficulty of living that, uh, living out those, uh, those beliefs, while also reconciling that and also struggling with instances of evil, or at least instances of suffering in the world. So this asks, this is, the, this is the version of the argument, I should say, that, uh, that we can envision asking God why he permits something. Why, God, do you allow such evil things to occur? This is something that any religious person has to ask and has to ultimately struggle with and has to ultimately come to an answer, um, whether that answer is provided by themselves, whether that answer is provided by uh, by the church or by religious authority, or whether that answer is provided by God in prayer. It is a distinctively religious problem because it's a problem for religious individuals within the context of their religious practice. And therefore, I am not qualified to give a real answer to this problem. I'm not you, the sufferer. Uh, I'm not a religious authority. Uh, I'm certainly not God. However, I can refer to uh, to some of the answers, at least that are provided by Christianity. Um, although, again, this is far outside my own wheelhouse uh, and my own authority. This goes far beyond um, what I am qualified to talk about. Suffice it to say that, that different traditions have had different answers to the problem of evil, the emotional problem of evil. And the Christian answer is typically, uh, has something to do with this. That is Christ's suffering on the cross. That is God's suffering with us. Because again, what does someone who is suffering want when they, when they bring up a problem? They don't want an answer to why the problem is occurring. What they want is sympathy. What we want, I even say, is sympathy. Suffering with us. But of course, as I said, this is a, only a vague and cursory answer and will have to be an inadequate one uh, coming from a, 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 strictly, uh, a strictly logical philosopher type such as myself. Uh, so if you are looking for answers to the religious problem, the, the emotional problem of evil, I can only provide uh, unfortunately little. However, the other two are far more within my expertise. 
That is because these two, the logical problem and the evidential problem, are strictly philosophical issues. They are philosophical challenges to a philosophical thesis. Both claim that the existence of God is impossible. Both make arguments for this conclusion. Uh, and they provide counter-arguments in each of their own unique ways to various arguments for God's existence. We'll begin with a logical problem. Uh, this is the version of the problem of evil we see presented by St. Thomas Aquinas as an objection to his arguments for God's existence. And it states that when two opposites or two contraries, he says, if one of the two is infinite, the other could not exist whatsoever. Good and evil are contraries. But if God were infinite good, that would necessarily mean that evil could not exist at all. In other words, the existence of God, that is, ultimate perfection, goodness itself, is incompatible with the existence of evil. Now, there are various answers uh, to this problem. Any, any kind of answer we propose to the logical problem must reconcile, well, it must either do one of two things, because this is a deductive argument. It must either undermine the premises, which are very difficult to question, uh, that evil exists and that good and evil are contraries to one another, or it must show uh, that there is no logical connection between the premises and the conclusion. Most objections, Aquinas is included, will, will do the latter. He'll try to show that it is, in fact, possible for contraries to coexist like this, for God to exist and for God, who is perfect goodness, to permit evil. This is what we call a theodicy. A theodicy, uh, as I've explained in another video, attempts to provide some hypothetical explanation for how it is that God could permit evil. As long as the hypothetical is logically possible, it does the job. It manages to show that the logical problem of evil fails. Now, there is another route of attack. Uh, against the logical problem of evil, uh, and this is the one that was favored by uh, favored more primarily by Saint Augustine, uh, also others obviously, um, Anselm as well, notably. Uh, and this is uh, the description of evil as privatio boni, which is Latin for the privation of good. In other words, evil is only describable, properly speaking as a lack or a corruption of something good. What this means is that evil does not exist independently. Essentially, it does not exist. If we were to ask, what is the essence of evil? What is pure evil? The answer could only be nothing. A lack of any being, a lack of any goodness. And so what we've done is we've denied one of the premises that evil exists. Because if evil doesn't exist, there's no problem of evil, or at least no logical problem of evil. All right. This might seem like a bit of a trick. I've explained some aspects of this elsewhere uh, as well. Um, but for now, this is it is enough to say that this is one of the primary ways of responding to the logical problem of evil by pointing out that evil is itself only a privation, it's only a lack of good, it's only a corruption of something good. It is, uh, to use some of, uh, some of Augustine's terminology, it is parasitic upon the good. Now, the second version, the problem of evil, is the evidential problem. To go into this difference, it's important to note that there are not only different ways of arguing against the existence of God, but there are different ways of arguing for the existence of God. And therefore, there are different ways uh, that th these, these arguments for and against must interact with each other in specific ways. It's the logical problem of evil, 
is an attempt to show a logical contradiction, an incoherency with the existence or even the idea of God. This is a, uh, a very significant criticism to deductive arguments for the existence of God, arguments which aim to show that God must exist from, uh, in a way that logically follows from, uh, from difficult to deny premises. And this is done uh, by way of something like a reductio ad absurdum, reduction to the absurd, showing that the concept we're trying to prove is absurd. However, on the other hand, we have various arguments for the existence of God which are inductive. They argue for God's existence on the basis of evidence. We observe certain things in the world which make it more likely that a creator exists or that God exists. There are various versions of the cosmological argument that do this. For example, um, arguing from a uh, temporal beginning of the universe, something like the Kalam version of the cosmological argument. Um, you also have other versions of uh, inductive arguments like the teleological argument. Argument from design in nature means that it seems likely that there ought to be a designer, and that designer seems to be the kind of thing we would call God. Things like this. There are, of course, many, many versions of inductive arguments. An inductive argument is more easily criticized by providing evidence to the contrary, by making the conclusion seem less likely to be true. And so that is what the evidential problem of evil does. The evidential problem of evil, therefore, is not equipped by its very nature, to argue against deductive arguments for the existence of God. This is something to keep in mind that we will have to come back to. So, what is, the, what is this evidential problem of evil? As I've said, it is an inductive argument. It begins by observing that there are many, many instances of evil in the world. There's a lot of bad things that happen. Note, even if evil does not exist, strictly speaking, metaphysically speaking, even if evil is a privation, this argument still gets off the ground. This argument still only is pointing out not that evil, some metaphysical being or entity, is, is logically contradictory or, or incompatible with the existence of God, but rather it is pointing out that there are many, many instances of evil. There are many bad things that are happening. To put it in precise philosophical terms, there are many things which are imperfect, things that are not as they should be. Now, this is a problem for the theist, uh, for the person who believes in God, because if God is perfect, we would expect the world to be good. The creation of a perfect being should be subsequently, or it should be consequently, sorry, good, right? We should have, uh, we, should, we should not expect there to be so many imperfections, evils, maybe we scare quotes, evils, as the case may be, uh, in creation if it was created by a perfect God. And so the more evil we can find in the world, again, loose description of evil, right? The more bad things we can find in the world, the less likely it becomes that this world was created by a, an omnipotent um, and benevolent God. All right. So, why does this not... Uh, why, does this, well, why does this work, first of all? Um, this is a fairly strong argument because we do, every day, notice that things, are, things go wrong, right? And we notice it quite a lot. Right? There are all manner of things that are not as they should be. For example, I'm slightly thirsty right now. It would be wonderful if I had a glass of water within arm's reach, but I don't. I, I, I happen not to. Uh, and so this is such a minor little thing. This seems like such a minor little thing, but there are so many instances of this. Not only am I slightly thirsty, but you might be as well when you're watching this. And that might mean that you have to pause it and get up and get yourself a drink, and that's a minor inconvenience. But it's not as it should be. Now compound this with, compound all of the minor little inconveniences you and I experience with the grave evils of the world, the intense instances of 
human and animal suffering. Terrible things happen, absolutely terrible things happen to people every moment of every day. I don't need to bring up examples, I don't think. I'm sure you can come up with those, think of those on your own. And so, it seems like this makes it unlikely that God exists. Now, here's the catch. That is the reason the inductive argument, this evidential argument, is not equipped to deal with deductive proofs for the existence of God, the, the likes of which I usually will refer to, things like Anselm's ontological argument or Aquinas's five ways, the, the cosmological arguments, the teleological argument, the arguments from uh, contingency, uh, the, the, uh, the transcendental arguments, so from uh, gradation and things, all of those. The reason for this is that a deductive argument does not show something to be more likely. It shows that it necessarily follows from its premises. And so, a deductive argument, if it is sound, shows that no matter how unlikely something is, it must be the case. So what does this mean? Well, if the uh, evidential argument, uh, the evidential problem of evil, even if it succeeds in showing that the existence of God is vanishingly unlikely, if, there's a, if there is a sliver of a chance that God exists, but there is still a sound and deductive argument for God's existence, then that unlikelihood, which is still possible, must be true. So, this is why um, a lot of philosophers will depend on deductive arguments, uh, particularly theistic philosophers will depend on deductive arguments for God's existence because of the major threat posed otherwise by uh, the uh, the evidential problem of evil. However, other philosophers, atheistic philosophers primarily, um, obviously I suppose, um, have uh, have attempted to modify the evidential problem of evil so that it does address deductive arguments for the existence of God. Most notably, uh, William Rowe uh, has put forward a version, an evidential version of the problem of evil, which seeks to prove that not only is God's existence unlikely, but unprovable. In other words, it's impossible, according to Rowe, uh, referring to his version of the problem of evil, it is impossible to show that it is possible for God to exist. How does he do this? Uh, well, I can go into, uh, I'll go into uh, brief details, at least for now. Um, he seeks to show that there are so many instances of evil, or so many instances of imperfection or of suffering. Suffering is his sort of preferred term for this. That if we wanted to provide a theodicy, the kind like Aquinas presents, we would need to provide an account of some good which could conceivably come about as a result of each instance of evil or suffering. The reason he proposes this is because if we don't come up with a at least some hypothetical theodicy for each instance, we don't know if there could be one. Each time we encounter a new instance of suffering, it could be conceivable that there would be no theodicy, there would be no hypothetical explanation for it. And if that were the case, then we would suddenly be back to the logical problem of evil, and that logical problem of evil would be intractable, would be unsolvable, because we wouldn't have a theodicy for it. So, what this means is, uh, the, the problem here, the, the major part of the problem that Roe proposes, is that it's not just that there are so many instances of evil, but there are an uncountable number of instances of evil, and that this number is growing at such a rate that we cannot hope to answer them all. So, for example, my problem of being slightly thirsty. Perhaps this is a case where 
uh, where I ought to offer this, uh, this minor suffering up as a sacrifice to God, and that that will bring me closer to the Lord, and that is a good thing. Okay, cool. That took about 10 seconds. In that 10 seconds, how many bad things happened in the world? We were starting to see the problem. Because in that 10 seconds, countless terrible things happened to countless people, and Roe includes, to countless animals around the world. Let's put a number on it completely arbitrarily and say, I don't know, 10 million bad things happened in those 10 seconds. Really lowballing it, I think. Um, if 10 million bad things happened in those 10 seconds, that means we now, after, after having talked about this problem for another minute or so, that means we have, what, another 60 million things that we need to account for? We better get started. Well, if we were to go one by one and try and answer each one in turn, we could never keep up, no matter how quickly we worked, within the limits of human possibility and human, human rationality, human understanding, we would never be able to account for all the instances of evil which are occurring at such a rapid rate. And so we cannot account for each instance of evil with a sufficient theodicy, and so we cannot, we necessarily cannot know that all of those instances can be accounted for. Right. This is one of the strongest versions of the problem of evil, certainly with the strongest version of the evidential problem of evil, because it brings it back into the logical problem but using the evidence presented by the evidential problem. Something of a synthesis between the two. Um, now, there are answers to this, uh, but again, that may be uh, the material for another video. So I think that's all the time I have, so I will leave you all with that, uh, with these three versions of the problem of evil, the logical problem, the evidential problem, and its various iterations, uh, and of course, the uh, emotional problem, which I only very briefly touched on. So with that, hopefully I will see you next time where we will go into more detail on either this or another topic. See you then.